Welcome to Hara Kung Fu Theater's 22nd Christmas special. You know, that took a long time. I don't know what, what's going on right here, but... But uh, look who I have here as a guest. A television icon here, Mr. Butch Patrick. How you doing? Where's my headpiece and my mask if this is Kung Fu Theater? Oh, because... Uh, Budget cuts? You know, you ever hear of low budget? <laughs> no budget. We're no budget, yeah. No. That's that's what, I think I invented that saying like 22 years ago. But Not a problem. Thanks for having me. No, no. It's my pleasure having such an icon like you. And for some of you people that live in Iraq or young people nowadays that don't know, he played Eddie Munster in The Munsters. Ask your folks or your grand folks yeah. or your grandparents. They'll love it. Yeah. Turn you on to Netflix or something and watch it. Yeah, because my nieces and nephew yeah. that are like, uh, well, yeah. what's that? Yeah, get the, <laughs> get the DVD on Amazon. Ask, it, ask for Christmas. Maybe Santa will bring it. <laughs> now, let, let's get into it. Let, let's get into this uh, history of Mr. Butch Patrick here. You have a, you have a Facebook and everything and, and all that, yeah. so why don't we you, we'll get that yeah. out of the way with them. We'll go back to it later. So tell these people to... Oh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Butch Patrick, BP Munster, Munsters.com is a website I've owned for about 15 years. A lot of Munster stuff there. If you want to find out what the show's about, if you've never seen the show, and if you have seen the show, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, putting, that, putting together a really nice book next year. This will be the 50th anniversary of the Munsters 2014. So September 24th will be 50 years to the day, and we're going wow. to um, have a book come out. It's going to be called Munster Memories. It's going to be a coffin table book, and it's going to have a bunch of good stuff in it. But it's all about the stories from the fans. I've met millions of fans over the years. I mean, literally millions. It's been a, it's been a 50-year run, so think about it and do the math. It could actually be a million people. Yeah, um, for sure. And they all have wonderful stories about what the show meant to them and how it inspired them as kids or this or that. And uh, I decided to put a book together that features their stories. So it's literally writing itself. That's very cool right there, because I was watching the Munsters when I was a uh, little, little Night Shadow, and, and I always wanted to be Eddie Munster, man, that live in that kind of a family. Then again, the family I had was kind of weird, too, so. <laughs> but uh, we'll just uh, yeah. di digress on that one. And you're into cars and stuff, too, and, and ink and tats? Well, tats? Jo you know, and one of my favorite things to do when I would take a lunch break during the shooting of the show on Wednesdays, they would let me, my mom would let me go down to the hobby store to get a slot car piece, a slot car track, and maybe a slot car occasionally. And then I would go to George Barris' shop to see what he was up to. If you don't know the Munsters, he built yeah. the Munster Coach and the Dragula. But before he did that, he was customizing cars for all the talent in Hollywood, all the stars. You couldn't uh, be cruising around Hollywood unless you had a George Barris custom vehicle. So I'd go down and see Sonny and Cher pick up their Mustangs or Frank Sinatra or Elvis or whatever. And that's when I started my love affair with cars was at George Barris's Custom City, which is still in North Hollywood. Uh, 60 years later, he just had his 88th birthday. Wow. So, yeah, uh, that's where my love affair for, star for cars started. And I'd buy and sell cars and send them to Australia. And over the years, I've seen so many people come up to me with tattoos of me, Eddie Munster, on their various body parts, or, you know, mostly, mostly arms and legs, thank God. But um, uh, a friend of mine came to me who is a tattoo artist, and he also manufactures ink. And Chris51 from Area 51 Tattoo asked if I would like to have a couple Munster colors. So now, next year, I'm going to be doing tattoo conventions, and we're going to have a contest of the best Eddie Munster tattoo um, tattoo in the country after we do 50 stops around the country at 50 different studios. Um, so anyway, if you're into color and you're into ink, check out Formula 51 or go to my website. It's listed there at Munsters.com. Do you, I know you get a lot of uh, fr friends and, and of the Munsters calling, you know, not calling you, but emailing you and stuff yeah. like that. Does that kind of get kind of tiring? Like, you know, hey man. <laughs> no, it's actually, for some reason I have, I have the temperament where when you go out and do autograph shows and you meet people, you better be able to answer the same question over and over and over because the people are asking it for the first time. So you have to be courteous and nice to them. And as long as people come up and are sincere and they love the show and they want to ask a question of where's Wolf Wolf or, you know, uh, Wolf did Wolf. the cars really run or how tall was Herman? You know, you got to understand this is the first time that they met you, so you should be gracious and nice and answer the question, and that's what I do. And if it does get to be too much, well, then you get up and you take a break, and uh, when you come back to the table, you're in a better mood. Well, that's a good attitude simple. to have. It's simple. Not like some of you prima donnas out there that's that true. I've got ran into, yeah. not mentioning no names. Yeah, like, that's uh, right. Uh, no, I, I run not. into, I mean, it, it, it can happen, and uh, it's not fair to the fans, it's not fair to yourself, so just try to stay in a good mood. You know, honestly, too, it, to really if you you're in 
love with somebody or because of their work or whatever, you their TV show or whatever, and you go up there and you're all happy and everything, and the person ends up being a prick, man. It's like, dang, yeah, what the heck happened there? And unfortunately, it's part of it's part of the system, the situation. But I've had a I've had a couple of very nice compliments. People who are new to the uh, to the circuit, so to speak, and they've observed me and my table, and I and I bring out a lot of nuts. I mean, I have my eight by tens, but I try to bring out. I like front door keys that are made to look like a tombstone and thirteen thirteen on them, and I have ink, and I have T-shirts, and I have DVDs, and I have just a lot of you know whatever I can find that's interesting stuff. So my table usually looks a little bit more, you know, fan friendly than the yeah. than a typical table. And a lot of people have said to me that well, I really would like to try to copy your lead because you seem to really have a good time with people and you're good to people. And it's kind of like I just treat people like I would like to be treated myself. It's a pretty simple, pretty simple situation. Now, you were with uh, Ivana Cadaver for a while, right? Ivana Cadaver. You guys were on KDOC. I've, I've known or... Ivana Cadaver a long time. It's a great show, uh, wonderful talent. Great body. Great body. <laughs> yep, great body. Great body. Uh, hey, Nat. <laughs> Hey, Nat. <laughs> hey, Nat. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, we did a show together. We started off as, a, first it was called 1313 Theater, and then it evolved into Macabre Theater. And then uh, her character, Ivana Cadaver, became, went to the forefront. Originally, she was going to be my sidekick, and then I kind of backed out of it, and she took over, and she really was good at it. So I decided that this would be the best thing for the show, would be for her to be the host. And so we're going to, and she's still working it very hard. And we I think she has like 48 shows in the can. So I think 2014, wow, you'll wild. see you'll see a new and improved, um, not that it had to be improved, but a new version and an updated version. And I think she's going to call it uh, Goat Sucker, Goat Sucker Productions or something, <laughs> you know, for like the vampire bat thing. Yeah, no, you that's know. cool. Yeah, so anyway, uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, you can uh, YouTube Ivana Cadaver Macabre Theater. And I'm, a, I'm on a few of the episodes myself, but the star of the show, the star of the show is Ivana. Now, you know, doing that show when you were a kid, was that a happy times or was oh, it yeah. here and there? Or Well, you know, I was the only kid on the lot, so I was 11 and 12 and a little bit of 13. So what little boys would like to do and young boys would like to do is they like to explore. I mean, that's what I did, when yeah. I, whether I was working or not. But imagine if you had the whole run of the Universal back lot at your disposal. And that's what I used to really look forward to were my days when I wasn't working and I could go exploring. Um, the Phantom of the Opera set, the, the soundstage, the largest soundstage in Hollywood, was right next to us. Um, my uncle used to supply horses to wagon train in the Virginian, so I'd go visit Uncle John. Uh, the McHale's Navy wow. Lagoon was in the back. I'd go visit Ernie Borgnine and Tim Conway and just kind of wander around the, the, the studio and see what they were building in sound stages. because what they would do is once they'd finished the movie, they would clean out a soundstage, and the next time they would use it, it would be a new product. So you'd go in there and say, what's this going to be and what are you building? And it was always something very cool. Did you go to a private school or a uh, home school or a regular well, it's school? It's kind of a home school. They supply you with a tutor Yeah. three hours a day. And then when the show is over, you go back to public school. And then when you work again, it's a tutor. So it's kind of a back and forth situation. How was that in public school? Did, did they kids, you know? Yeah, that was pretty brutal. Was it? <laughs> yeah. They didn't treat you like a... Uh, yeah, you know, kids are kids, you know. It just, yeah, you know, you're right. That's one of the ways I got thick skin. I just figured if the roles were reversed, I would probably be on the other side, you know, taunting myself or taunting the person. Yeah. But uh, it gave me thick skin, and it taught me how to be a survivor. And I was very small for my age, and when I went back into the junior high system, I was in the seventh grade. And after the first day, they threw me out because I was causing a disturbance because all the kids weren't going to class, and they were all hanging around the nutrition bench and, you know, looking at Eddie Munster eat his, you know, honey bun and whatever. And then um, they kicked you out because of that. Huh? They kicked you out because of yeah, that. Yeah, the, the vice president came and got me. The vice principal came and got me and threw me out and said he's causing too much of a disturbance. We can't have him. And I went back the next day and then they threw me out again. And then the next day, the third day, they finally they let me stay. And um, but the bottom line was I got very smart. I befriended a couple ninth graders real quick. And then I had my little, you know, my protectors. And then, um, but you know, it was it was tough. It was a, it was a tough first year because. Um, you know, the kids will be kind of, they can be cruel, but at yeah. the same time, it gave me thick skin and kind of made me who I am today, which is a very tolerant person. Yeah, you cruel little kids out there. It's Christmas Bullying. time. Bullying. Hey, Santa ain't going to give you nothing for, Santa Claus ain't going to give you You're nothing You're going to get coal. Christmas. Not even coal, unless he throws it at you, you little Miss Cretans. Dang. And that, that vice president guy, you bastard. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. He's probably dead, though, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, his son or daughter, you should be ashamed of yourself having a dad like that. Now, do you have tattoos? 
I only have one. It's my back shoulder blade, and it's a comedy and tragedy thing, and it's got my sobriety date in it. So it's a lega. It's just not ink to be inked. It was actually a, a significant symbolic mm -hmm. gesture. And I did it for a friend of mine, Tattoo Tony, who does all Brett Michaels tattoos. He was uh, doing a TV show pilot. And he wanted me to be on it, so I said, "Okay, I'll get a tattoo for you." And then now next year I'm having Kat Von D do an Eddie Munster on Ooh, my other shoulder blade. Kat Von D. Kat Von D. She's a hottie. Yes, yeah, she is. And uh, have her do one to introduce the ink. So it's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, I don't. I like the artwork today for tattoos. It's it's way past what it used to be 50 years ago with an anchor and a mom and a dripping dagger yeah, or something. They've, yeah. It's become very much an art form. And these guys are very talented. So um, if you're looking for some good ink and you've got some color going on, or you, even if you have a tattoo studio, go to my website. Contact me. Munsters.com, and maybe we can do a, a promotion for you. So is let, let me get this uh, right though, because I'm kind of slow from chair shots and the wrestling world mm -hmm. and everything. Is is it you guys develop? You develop different colors. Yeah, there's 52 colors of uh, of, of Formula 51. There's two Munster colors. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a green and a purple, but there's actually 52 colors, one for every week of the year, I suppose. But anyway, there's a bunch of colors, and it's really vibrant and it's high pigmentation. It's got a high pigment count, so the tattoo artists love it because it's a really good ink, and it's got witch hazel in it as an ingredient, which makes it bright. Wow! I so know the that people that use it like it. That's cool. Yeah. Now, have you ever um, talked to people like saying that they have a tattoo of, of you on them? Yes. They come up to you? I have a lot of them. A lot been, of people? Yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people have got the Munsters, uh, not so much myself, but the, the whole family. Uh, and, and in fact, I'll tell you one of the funniest stories that ever came up. This guy came up and he had a really beautiful Eddie Munster right here and he's showing me. And my only response to him was just, tell me you're left handed. <laughs> Please. <laughs> You know, we have a guy on the show. I for, I just not thought about him. He he probably met you. Uh, he he comes on the show. We call him the heart, the human horror tapestry. Yeah. He, his name is Daniel Gonzalez, and he has tattoos everywhere. Now I'm thinking about. It, I think he has one of you on there. I wouldn't be surprised, me. And it's the Universal right. Monsters. You know, the show is developed from the Universal Monsters. So whether it's Frankenstein, Elvira, the creature, Wolfman, vampire, you know, uh, Dracula. The monsters were basically those monsters, just yeah. friendly ones. So you can use the universal monsters, the old school monsters, or the monsters themselves. But a lot of people have those shows. You know, I heard who, who uh, this character was, um, Grandpa. Yep. And I've heard all kinds of stuff. At one time, I even met him long time ago when he, uh, they had a, what was that? I think it was Famous Monsters Convention over here by Universal. Uh, the one of the hotels by there, I think it was. It was probably Beverly Garland. The something. The Beverly you know. Garland Hotel by Universal, yeah. Oh, he's a character, yeah, man. He's, he's, he was he's, yelling at somebody. He had a cigar, and he was yeah. like, get I was actually at that con. Uh, he, he got out of control that day. He yeah. Was, he, was, he was really over the top on these people, and, and it wasn't very nice. It really wasn't. That's, that must have walked right in when I seen him because he was yeah, going he, off. He was really, he was really having a, a, not a meltdown, but it was close to it. But he was, he was, for some reason, he was very mean that day. He was very mean-spirited. And a lot of times he's funny. Mm -hmm. But that particular day he was mean. And I did a lot of apologizing to a lot of people nope. that day. <laughs> For his antics. But normally he wasn't like that. Normally, well, guy. normally you remember him. I mean, he, you know, you remember him whether you love him or whether you hate him. Yeah. You remember him. Usually you love him, but this particular day, yeah, it was a lot of complaints days, about that day. Yeah, he was telling somebody off. He didn't, and I kind of was like agreeing with him, but then he kept on. I was like, oh, okay, well. Yeah. So I didn't, I turned around and walked away because yeah. I was scared. I know, I remember, it was at the Beverly Garland <laughs> Hotel, I remember it. I was scared, so I didn't want to have, you know, <laughs> I, was, I was probably my prime that day, all, you know, not. So many burritos and everything, and I was buffed and everything. But I don't want no part of Grandpa, man. I, I was scared of him. Yeah, Grandpa, and by the way, Grandpa's like six foot three. He's a big guy. Is he? Oh yeah. Everybody thought he was little because he was standing next to Herman, who was seven foot tall with his shoes on. But Al's actually was I a big was a big that. man. Yeah, he was a good sized gentleman. Wow, I thought because when I seen him, he didn't look. And, then again, and, I wasn't and don't let that one particular day be represented. No, that, no, was, no. that was one day in a I man's life, like eighty-four him. years, and it was just happened to be a bad day. I think yeah. he just probably had the you know a mild little meltdown of some sort. In fact, I think I liked him more. <laughs> okay, just, cause was, just because he could do it. He was going off, man. He was like, "Tell me, you ain't gonna." Hey, I didn't like the way you were looking at me, man. So you're not. I'm gonna, yeah. You're gonna hear something right now. Yeah. Is there any episodes that were your favorite one of the Munsters that you really... I have several. I have, well, basically three, because there's 70 episodes, and they had written me... A lot of times, originally, when you do a series, the kid, 
by nature, a lot of times they just, they have minimal parts for kids. You kind of walk into a scene, you say a line or two, and then you kind of meander off. But for some reason, the, the rapport that we had with Fred Gwynn, who played Herman, and myself and Grandpa, they started writing a lot of good scripts for Eddie with a lot of dialogue and a lot of interaction with the adults. So like a regular character, like you're one of the, you're one of the big three type of thing. Mm -hmm. So the one that I really enjoyed the most was when I grew a beard and not only was it funny to see a 10 year old oh. kid with, with a full beard, <laughs> but it was also yeah. very funny that Paul Lynn played Dr. Dudley and his, and how he handled the Herman Munster coming to see him and looking out the window and seeing me with the beard and a paper bag over my head. <laughs> Very funny stuff. Uh, the other one I like a lot was Zombo, where I thought a TV host like yeah. yourself was a real guy. And I won a contest, and when I went to the studio, I saw that it wasn't real. Yeah. And I was very depressed, and that was Louis Nye, world-class com yeah. com comedic actor, yeah. played Zombo, and that's a good one. And then Hot Rod Herman, where we went to the drag strip, lost the Munster coach, Grandpa built the Dragula yeah. out of a coffin and some stuff, and then we went back and went, won it, and that was the introduction of the Dragula into the show. And I liked that because I loved cars, and we were at the drag strip, so that was pretty cool. You know, speaking of Zombo, there's there's a character in uh, Nevada who took that over. I don't know how he got Zombo? permission. Yeah, no. there's, a actually a, there's actually a football player named Zombo too. There's Is there? A, yeah, there's a he's a, 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 a uh, an end, I think he's a defensive end with the Kansas City Chiefs or something. But somebody, there's a guy named Zombo. Oh, I thought that was wow. hilarious. Yeah, his last yeah. name. I don't know how, like I said, I don't know how he got, but he dresses like him. Yeah. And, and in Good. fact, I think he's on uh, coming on a channel over here in L.A. When I forgot what it is, but I, the way they describe the character is him. It's Zombo because yes. he looks like Witchy Poo a little bit. And with a hair like a clown, maybe witchy poo. Yeah, the nose. Oh, the nose. Oh, yeah. The oh, nose. yeah. You know, I worked with I worked with Billy. I Hayes know you did. On Lidsville. She was my genie. Lidsville was a was a good show. It was the man. cuckoo kookiest. Yeah, but it was a cool show. Who, who's the uh, people that you work with over there? Charles Nelson Riley and Sid Marty Croft and Jean, Billy Hayes, and then uh, a lot. Every see when you grow up in Hollywood, uh, you have stand-ins are little people. They don't yeah. use other kids to stand in for other kids. So I got to know every little person and you know, a mutual friend of ours, Felix Silla. And, yeah, good old Felix. And lots of other people that I've known over the years that were my stand-ins went over to Paramount in 71 and were part of the Lidsville little people hat colony uh -huh. that we had. We had about 25 little people working. That was a summer to remember between Charles and Billy and myself and all these little hat people running around. It was a summer. It was it was a very crazy summer. And that was that cool working with them. And oh yeah. Ask. Well, we did. It was the first show that ever used chroma key, and then we also had three cameras going. Uh, we had a, a director on another sound stage, so you had the big booming voice from above, like a you know like God was talking to yeah, you about this. Yeah. So it was kind of interesting. I'd never never done that before, but it was very. Uh, it was a very uh, a progressive uh, pro a progressive production. We did like 18 pages a day. Wow. Which was a lot. Witchy poo, man. Witchy poo. Yeah. And Weenie Genie. <laughs> I said, can't you change the name of this character from Weenie Genie? Is there, <laughs> is there any chance? Oh, Weenie, come forth. Yeah. And I look, yeah. Up, I look at the director on the monitor. I go. <laughs> <laughs> it's different times. You know? Ah. And uh, is there any other shows that you worked on that you... Well, it's Christmas time. One of my favorite things I did, um, the Beatles came on the set when I was on the Munsters, and I missed them that day, and I was so oh. depressed. But to make up for it, kind of, I did the Monkees Christmas show. And I was 14 years old in the eighth grade, and I thought this was like about the coolest thing that could happen because the Monkees were huge. It was a TV show. I was the guest, mm -hmm. the main guest on it, and I played Melvin Vander Snoot, and the Monkees were there to teach me the meaning of Christmas, and uh, they had a really tough time of it. But what a great week it was for a kid to be working with the Monkees in 1968. I would imagine, yeah. Now this might be, I think this might be an urban legend. I don't know, or myth or something. But didn't one of those guys family invent whiteout or something? His mom did. Michael Nesmith's mom. So that's true then. Yeah, yeah. Michael Nesmith's mom uh, invented uh, liquid paper. Is what wow, it was. So or whiteout. One of the two. Liquid. I think, it's, I think it's liquid paper. Yeah. But the bottom line is, yeah, he did. And, and Mike left the show, when after the, the show was over. Mike went on to do great things with a, a production company called Elephant Parts. Very, uh, very cutting edge stuff. Very progressive. And then uh, recently he's toured since Davey passed away. He's now been touring with the Monkees, and I'm going to be seeing him next uh, in March at a Monkees convention. I do a lot of Monkees conventions because I was on the show. Wow. Did a guest man. role. That was that fun. That was really cool. Yeah. I, that guy don't got to work at all no more. Yeah. <laughs> wonder what's that like? Well, another what? Will not have to work. <laughs> you don't have to work anywhere. You can just uh, stay home. Well, the con what, the conventions? No, I mean the, him. Oh, him. The, yeah, he, he and he inherited quite a bit of money. 
But he doubled it. He, whatever she gave him, he had, he doubled it on his own. So, I mean, he was a good businessman. Yeah, well, that's smart, man. Gee, hey, uh, if you want to come on a show and yeah. pay me, then... Yeah, we get some paper. You. I fix it. <laughs> Give me some paper, and I don't mean no liquid paper. I mean the green guy. No, I'm just kidding. No. I'm just kidding. So you want to tell your Facebook again, so everybody... Our yeah, sure. But Butch Patrick, Facebook, and that one's filled up. Then I have Butch Patrick 2, T-O-O. I got 5,000 each one of those. And then there's the Butch Patrick fan group, which is unlimited in the amount of people. So you can go to that one as well. And then Twitter accounts. And, you know, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, but Munsters, Munsters.com is always a good place to go. And leave your, you leave your story if you like the Munsters and you want to be in the book. MonstersMemories.com, and even if I don't, I'm gonna have 169 actual stories, yeah. 13 stories of 13 chapters, and if you're not picked, everybody's gonna get acknowledgement in the back of the book for submitting. So even if you're not in it, your name's gonna be in print in the book, oh, wow. and I'm gonna keep it limited edition to 2,500 books. It's not gonna be a huge mass, you know, money-making thing. It's gonna be really for the fans. Man, that that might be with just the names of the people that submissions. That might be a book in itself, man. We'll see. Wow, I didn't know that you could still turn in. Yeah, that's good. Know, I think I'll write something. Now. Yeah, I got I got seven hundred and fifty right now, and I'm probably going to wind up with another thousand or so by the time the thing goes to print. Was and, you know I'm not trying to talk about like you know gossip and stuff yeah. like that, but did you ever meet meet somebody or work with somebody that you really and you don't even have to say the name, but disliked like you're they were really just oh sure you know that's kind of but that's like it that's the, 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 the movie industry the movie industry is just a microcosm of the real world. I mean you're going to run into people walk down the street. There's going to be idiots. There's going to be people you dislike, and it's just it's just the nature of the beast. Unfortunately, what happens in Hollywood and people their egos come into play when a lot of people become famous or semi-famous and usually the more famous you are the nicer you are it's the people that aren't famous that want to be famous are mm -hmm. the ones that you usually have trouble with but um i mean that's always not the truth but yeah. generally but yeah you run into people that you would you know you, you would probably not invite to your party but i always hung out with see my my trick was i was lucky i was around really nice people on the cast members but i always hung out with the crew that was the guys that the guys that did up in the catwalks, yeah. the guys that did the special effects, the guys that did the makeup, and we had the best. Of, we had the best makeup people. We had the best, you know, uh, special effects people, and then we had George Barris down at his shop. The guys that were building the cars. So I hung around with the people that weren't in front of the camera. Wow, so that was my little escape. And I lived 30 miles away from Hollywood, so I would drive to work. I'd leave it behind me, go behind the studio gates, do my do my job. And I was just doing it to make money because I wanted to be a race car driver, which never really happened. But I never really wanted to be an actor. I was just a kid that could, you know, hit my marks and remember the lines. No, that's that's not an easy thing to do, though. You know, I probably couldn't do it as well today. Oh. <laughs> I was good at it as a kid. <laughs> was there ever talk about having a, uh, the monsters meet the Adams family or? No, no, never, you know? never came up. No, although I did do it. There was a show called the Adams Family Funhouse that was filmed in 1972, and I played Pugsley. On the show, did you? What'd you think? Put John, a uh, right yeah, there, it was or? fun. The cast, it was an interesting cast. They had um, um, Mr. Carlin, Jack Riley was Gomez, Liz Torres was Morticia, Pat McCormick, the, the stand up comic, mm -hmm. was uh, Lurch, Stubby K was Uncle Fester. <laughs> I mean, talk about it. What and Jim Neighbors was our special guest of the week. What? Oh, it was, it was, it was awful. There? Did he see an opera on there? It was awful. <laughs> no. No, but it was pretty bad. <laughs> All right, well, Mr. Pat, I really do appreciate you coming no on the problem. show. And uh, hey, Dirk, so what movie are you gonna Dirk? watch? Oh, we're gonna watch. Thank you for helping, <laughs> helping me with that. <laughs> Since it's the twenty-second Christmas special, we're gonna watch Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Uh, and that's so, not an easy thing to do. No, it's not easy. <laughs> Just for you younger folks, man. This is like when. Uh, this is a special kind of uh, TV here. This ain't your... They're behaving strangely. They appear to be troubled. They don't care to sleep. I had to use the sleep spray on them again. I mentioned this to my council chiefs today, and I learned it's the same with children all around the planet in every district. Something is happening to the children of Mars. Kemar, as leader of the Martians, you must do something about it. I know. But what? Why don't you go to the forest and see Chochem, the Ancient One? And again, they must learn to play. They must learn what it means to have fun. We need a Santa Claus on Mars. Uh, 
Uh, and that's well, not an easy thing to do. No, it's not easy. <laughs> Especially for you younger folks, man. This is like when, uh, this is a special kind of uh, TV here. This ain't your computer graphic stuff like this. This is the real edgy kind where they have a robot and he's in like uh, tin foil. And, and they're green. On, yeah, and they're green. And, and my favorite character on there was Floppo. Remember him? I haven't seen it in He's a while. That weird one, I'm looking right? forward to it. Yeah, being a horror host, you know, we, I know all this stuff. Well, not all of it, but but we're going to play Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. And uh, we'll have your information at the end of the show, too, yeah. for people. Can It'll be on of, the crawl. Yeah. Can you hear some of you? Santa for bringing happiness to the children of Mars. And the Christmas spirit to all of us. Sure. From the bottom of my heart, I wish you and yours. The very best of everything. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas, everybody! Drop full Claus is here! Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Oh, you forgot <laughs> wait! <laughs> oh, yes! No pillows! Look! Look, kids! No pillows! <laughs> <laughs> now, if we hurry, we can get back in time for Christmas Eve. Yay! Shall we get going? Yay! Goodbye, dear friends. Away!